Hi, everybody. I'm Dan Langley, and this is the Manufacturing IT Podcast. Each week, I speak with key stakeholders, industry titans, and some of the legends who are advancing manufacturing and digitalization across all sectors. I hope you enjoyed this episode and are a little wiser afterwards. Let's get to it. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the latest episode of the Manufacturing IT Podcast. I'm joined today by Matt Barber. Matt, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Um, Yeah, I'm I'm really excited to be here and talk to you today about MES. Good. Well, Matt, you and I live fairly close. Most of the other guests I've had on a podcast have been in other countries, other continents and and quite far away. But but you and I are sitting probably 30 or 35 miles away in the UK. So it's great to have you here. Yeah, and sharing the same bad weather at the moment as well. <laughs> Definitely. Well, Matt, look, please give yourself a bit of an intro to people that, that don't know you and kind of maybe a bit of an insight into to kind of who you are. Yeah, so uh, yeah, hi, everyone. My name is Matt Barber. I, I guess you could say I kind of fell into manufacturing and MES. You know, it wasn't, <laughs> wasn't something that was planned. I actually did a, a university course on software engineering. And that, that course was kind of, I would say, 80% computer science and then 20% kind of business and economics to get that broader, rounder picture. And then, yeah, after my second year at university, I did a did a placement year. That was at a company called Lighthouse. They were a pure play MES company. And by pure play, I mean they they just did MES. You know, they weren't an ERP trying to go into the MES space or an automation company trying to go into the MES space. And I worked there in kind of a technical role, working very closely with databases. With um, you know, I wrote a lot of code, and I was lucky enough to visit a few factories in that time as well. And then, yeah, at the end of that placement, they offered me a, a full-time job, which I accepted. And then the rest, as they say, is, is mm-hmm. history. Yeah, no, it's an interesting one because a lot of people, uh, a lot of times when I speak to clients or people in the industry, Matt, you know, a lot of their recommendation is coming into MES from a manufacturing shop floor background. And then people start to work up, get familiar with technology and and work with MES that way. But, but obviously, you entered the MES space, you know, via the software engineering side. But how was that kind of working for you and, and kind of how was that baptism into manufacturing? Yeah, to be honest, yeah, like I said, I, di- I didn't really kind of plan going into manufacturing. Mm-hmm. It just kind of happened. But I think, you know, if you look at the MES space, MES is a place where you're building a product. So there are a lot of technical people mm-hmm. and it's there's many different skill sets in there. So you've got you've got the people who are the engineers, you've got the people who kind of more understand the customer requirements, the people who have come from manufacturing and really understand the manufacturing problems. And although I came in from the more technical route, I very quickly kind of steered onto the more customer facing roles, which which I really enjoyed. I I kind of felt like that was something I was I was good at and something I was interested in. You know, even though I was technical, I I was still able to travel and, and meet customers and try and implement projects for them. And yeah, I love visiting factories. You know, I love talking to customers. I love understanding their challenges and understanding their pain points. And also it's just seeing manufacturing processes. I find manufacturing itself really fascinating. And yeah, sometimes you go into like a new a new factory, you see their manufacturing process, and it could be one of two kind of completely opposite ends of the spectrum. Sometimes you go in and you, know, you, you see something kind of really advanced and uh, and some really sophisticated technology. That's exciting. But on the flip side, you also sometimes go in and see a manufacturing process where things are kind of like beautifully simplistic. You know, mm-hmm. so someone has designed something very, very simple, almost graceful. And I find that that really fascinating as well. I see those processes and I, I want to shake the hand of the person who, <laughs> who, uh, who, who designed them. And, I, and I've seen a few of those. That's been that's been very, very exciting for me. I, I love that. Yeah, I, I, Matt, I think a lot of people are kind of talk about entering manufacturing and working manufacturing the same kind of maybe it wasn't a route that was thought about it wasn't a route that was considered but but kind of like myself tripped and fell and and ended up working within that space and i think there's the big misconception between actually what manufacturing is versus what it actually really is like and especially we kind of advance the more kind of digital environments especially kind of the old kind of dark dingy gray concrete floor side of the business that's unsafe and you know, maybe not that appealing is actually becoming a pretty cutting edge factory floor now. So, yeah, interesting to hear your take on that. Oh, yeah, I've, I've been to all sorts of places, um, <laughs> yeah, both, both ends of that spectrum. You know, I've been to kind of the, the deepest, darkest depths of China where, uh, where <laughs> that's cool, where, where things are done in, 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 in one, one way. And then I've been to kind of very advanced manufacturing environments with, with very sophisticated manufacturing processes. 
you go to places with clean rooms you know you you, you can't enter the factory floor unless you're fully kitted out and all this all this mm. different gear you're not allowed to wear your wedding ring um <laughs> or any other kind of jewelry i've got to wear a beard net which is <laughs> always that for me but yeah i, I think there's still a there's a huge gap in manufacturing between kind of the most sophisticated and the least sophisticated and i think that shows in in the manufacturing processes and the environments and it shows in the software or or lack of software let's say yeah i think you mentioned one of the interesting things there is that kind of huge gap that we see in manufacturing between the companies that are relying on tribal knowledge and kind of internal you know it's been always done this way and that's how it will be done Versus the kind of challenger companies, the companies like Tesla or whoever that are, you know, redefining what manufacturing process, production lines and, and everything can look like. So, yeah, I guess that the kind of span of, of environments is huge. Yeah, r- really huge. And actually, one of the things someone said to me recently, which I, I really resonated with me, they said, yeah, everyone has an MES system. It's just some people's MES system is is paper and Excel and shouting <laughs> across the factory floor. You know, everyone is trying to solve that problem. But yeah, some people are doing it in one way and, and some people are doing it in, in a different way. Yeah, those paper-based or Excel-based ones, I um, you know, I've never really worked with an MES, but I can imagine from my perspective how challenging that must be. <laughs> yeah, I think potentially would be fair to say Excel is our biggest competitor. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk a bit, a little bit about at Lighthouse because it's a company that I said to you before we recorded. You know, the headquarters, you know, located fairly close to where my parents live, so I kind of walked past that quite a few times, kind of recognised the name, and and obviously now with the acquisition by Infor a couple of years back, some people might not see Lighthouse advertised too much. But look, talk us through a little bit about Lighthouse. You know, it's an interesting company because it was a pure MES software company as opposed to is an ERP or an automation company dabbling in MES. So yeah, give us a little bit about Lighthouse and, and kind of your journey there. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I did my placement year at Lighthouse, as I said, that was around 15 years ago. Uh, and then I came came back after after my placement year. They offered me a job, which I which I gratefully accepted. And then, I, yeah, like I said, I kind of worked my way through the, the solution architect type roles, more customer facing roles, and then eventually in product. But just a, a bit of background about Lighthouse. Lighthouse was originally started around 1990. It was a software company that originally didn't do MES. It did quality and SPC software. And at the time, yeah, Lighthouse, I think it actually produced the first SPC application that ran on Windows. You know, a lot of them at the time were running on, on DOS and, and other platforms, but it was the first Windows-based SPC application. And the, the founders kind of realized over time that you know, quality and isolation was okay, but actually there are many different departments in the factory that are all using these kind of Excel paper-based systems that we've talked about. Or maybe they have got systems in place in other areas, but they're you know, disparate disconnected systems without that kind of level of communication. So that's really where the, the, the MES product shop for online came from. They realized that actually we need a product here that can cover all of the manufacturing operations. And as far as I'm aware, it was actually you know, shop for online was actually the first fully web-based MES system in the world. And actually more recently, the first fully HTML5 MES system in the world. There were some applications that had an HTML5 kind of reporting layer on top of an old system, but but we actually changed it to be fully HTML5, which I think was a really huge achievement. So yeah, in that respect, I think Lighthouse has always been quite a, a, a pioneering company hmm. um, and kind of pushing the boundaries of, of the market. Even though we're relatively small in size, it was, it was always doing big things despite being a small company. I always find it fascinating, that kind of like pioneering journey you know, with company founders and stuff and, you know, creating a product or, or recognizing the need for a product and then and then building something out. That kind of pioneering, you know, punching above your weight is, is always such a, you know, especially for us Brits, the underdog, but always kind of a really fascinating, fascinating journey. Must be an exciting time. Yeah, really exciting. And if you think about the fact that it started in quality, and now we, we do we do everything in operations management. So you know, if you look at if you look at our software, it's it's incredibly broad. I think it's one of the broadest on the market, and it covers you know production, quality, inventory, logistics, maintenance, tooling, energy. You know everything that the operational users need to be aware of and involved in and different transactions they need to perform it's all done in in our mbs system so yeah really really exciting and and i think it's that kind of broad functionality with a really strong focus on user experience that led info to acquire us let me ask you this what's it you know shop floor online and i guess is the product still called that now that it's part of the kind of in four umbrella is it still called shop floor online 
No, it's been rebranded. So it's now called In4MES. In4MES, okay. That's what it says on the tin. That makes it. What industry is kind of, is kind of where In4MES best suited now and, and kind of maybe what, what was your kind of industry background? I know you mentioned some factories in China and different facilities, but maybe a little bit about industry expertise and a little bit about kind of industry use cases. That, that's always interesting to hear. Yeah, I think, um, again, one of the things that I think is a really strong selling point of, of our product is that it does cross many different boundaries. So, for example, it does discrete, it does assembly, it does process, it does batch. And that's quite powerful. A lot of MES systems focus on kind of one or the other or maybe a couple. Mm. But you do have these kind of big manufacturing organizations with different departments. And some departments might be process related operations, some departments might be discrete, some might be assembly. So you do need MES systems on the market that can kind of cater to all of those, all of those different use cases. In terms of industry, I think as you know, as Lighthouse and now as Infor, that there was a very strong correlation on the focus industries, which was mm-hmm. good. But we're particularly big in things like packaging, food and bev, automotive, fast moving consumer goods, consumer packaged goods. That those kind of those kind of industries. Although we do kind of have customers scattered across in a, in a, in a whole whole variety of different places what we don't typically do is like primary you know, primary metals and things like that we don't do like mm-hmm. continuous processes we would normally start from the kind of secondary stage okay no that's interesting and i guess that's also one of the the beautiful parts of of mes being able to touch so many different industry sectors and, and manufacturing processes as well but but usually it's when products are you know a jack of all trade and able to do a lot that's when there's as often a lot of challenges but i guess when you kind of put it in a square peg in a, in a round hole, but but if the platform and the mission was to help across different sectors, you know, it's building, you know, it's priced in on the ticket. Yeah, to be honest, that's kind of one of the reasons I moved out of the solution architect type role into product. So, you know, when I was part of the solution architect team, I noticed, you know, I, I was managing customers across different industries. My, my my colleagues were managing customers across different industries, and at the time. We had a very highly configurable and flexible product, but I would have described it as more of a toolkit. Mm. So you, you ha- when you've got a toolkit, you need engineers to assemble the building blocks in the toolkit. Yeah. And that meant we kind of went from, you know, we went to the customer, we asked them what they wanted, and then we used the toolkit to build them a solution. And that meant that we built these solutions that sometimes were solving the same problems in an inconsistent way, and also in a slow way, because... Yeah you've got to reinvent the wheel every time or, or copy what you've done somewhere else. And that's not really a, a very good way to work. So I, I was quite vocal about that. You know, other people in the organization also recognized that that was a problem. And uh, that led to me being given this kind of product role. We, we didn't really have a product organization, sorry, a product department within the organization before that. It was kind of a little bit ad hoc and you know, the founders did some of it, but nothing too structured. But yeah, because I wanted this kind of out of the box configurable solution, and I saw that that's where the market was going, that they gave me the opportunity to to create the department and scale that department within the organization. And I loved that challenge. I really loved that challenge. And it, and it wasn't just a configurable out of the box kind of push. It was also around user experience and the user interface. Mm. But of course, with product, it's a bit challenging because it sits at the center of everything in the organization. Mm. There, there's someone actually who works at Info who I have a lot of respect for. And, and they once said, you know, being in product is like being the, the spider in the middle of the web, <laughs> <laughs> which which I really agree with because you kind of touch and connect with all areas in the business. You know, you're, mm. you're, you're talking with development about what the product needs to do. Mm. You're talking with services about you know, requests from customers and uh, and best practices and how to implement things. You're talking directly with customers. You're talking with sales and helping them win the business. You're working with marketing and, and you're setting the pricing. You know, everything comes back to the product. So, yeah, that was a really great experience kind of piecing all of that together. Yeah, it's, it's a good segue into talking about product, Max, actually, because it's an area that I was keen to talk about. And, you know, it's funny you mentioned kind of the spider at the center of the web. Because, you know, recruiting for MES product positions are always such a hard one for us because there's so many different threads and different directions this person could have been in or come from and kind of looking to develop their career in. But I guess kind of if you can tell us a little bit about how you find working in a product role and, and maybe some of the threads that you like pulling out and, and some of the areas that they kind of you get enjoyment working on, that would be good. Yeah, definitely. So I've been working in a product role for the last five years. 
actually since the acquisition of Info, despite having a product title, it's it's almost it's just such a tiny proportion of what I do now. <laughs> you know, my, my title hasn't changed, but my role has changed significantly. So I, I do less and less of the of the product side of things. But I find the product very interesting. You, you have to have an eye on the market. Mm. Yeah, you, know, you have to be a visionary. You have to be thinking about. It, it takes time to develop a product. So you, you can't just wake up in the morning and be like, oh, yeah, we, it needs to do this now because that's what yeah. other people are doing. You need to be thinking about that way ahead of time. Mm. And so you need to have kind of your, yeah, your 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 finger on the pulse of the market. You need to be communicating with customers. You need to be hearing what their challenges are. And one of the things that's really interesting in working across industries is although everyone thinks their industry is the special industry and their <laughs> the special challenges, and in many cases, they do have nuanced challenges. Mm. You can kind of pick out the overarching threads and the pain points. And there often is a lot of correlation, a lot of overlap. So when you can pull those things out and put those into your product and let that have a benefit across your entire customer landscape, that's very, very re- rewarding. Yeah, um, and, and zoom, being able to zoom out from the individual nuances, but look kind of where there's, you know, patterns of challenges, patterns of, of kind of KPIs that need to be improved, et cetera. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly that. So, Matt, let me ask you this. So there'll be people listening to this episode that are kind of maybe at the upward curve of their career and, and thinking, you know, product role, being involved with the product, that's a really interesting path for them. So that if he was to create, you know, a character in a video game of the, the perfect MES product professional, product owner, product manager, whatever, what what attributes would you give that person? And kind of what experiences do you think that person, appreciate you're on the spot here, but, but what, what kind of attributes and kind of skills and experience would this person need to, to kind of be the, the ultimate product person? Yeah, that's a good question. I think they would need to have you know, one of the superpowers would need to be, you know, visionary <laughs> eyesight to see way yeah. ahead into the future, as, as we just mentioned. I think they'd probably need some form of armor because you know, <laughs> someone, resilience. Someone, yeah. <laughs> so, someone once said to me, if uh, if you're gonna be the if you're gonna be a pioneer, then expect to get arrows in your back. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so I think uh, yeah, you'd need some sort of armor for sure. And I think kind of almost like a just a resilience. You need to believe in your vision and you need to keep pushing that forward. You don't want to do that at the expense of other people's view. Like it's very, very important to bring other people together to listen to their, not just people in your team, but people in the wider organization, people, you know, your customers, the market analysts. You want to get a real feeling for for that. So, yeah, I, I guess if you're going to, I can't think of a, 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 <laughs> in, a, in, a in a video game, but you, you want someone who is like a, a mediator, someone who can yeah. listen and understand and, and kind of extrapolate and, and create a vision from that information. Yeah, no, I think that, that that makes sense. And I think from, when looking from the outside in, Matt, and, you know, with a product like MES, which covers, you know, quality, manufacturing, IT, engineering, you know, production, you're talking about creating something for so many different stakeholders. It's almost sits like a rarefied requirements. You know, it, it's such a unique area of a business that, that an MES sits. Did you find that part kind of enjoying or challenging or kind of what's your thoughts on having to you know, engage with so many different stakeholders on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I love talking to people, so uh, very, very happy, <laughs> very happy doing that. I, th- I think that what I would say is it's an area where you can't rush getting from A to B. Mm. You know, th- there's a you have to get some experience under your belt, and that takes a lot of time. And, and I mean years. You don't start doing an MES role and really, really deeply understand it for several years. You know, there's so many facets to it, so much information, so many different stakeholders. So it's it's you've got to be patient. You know, and that's why I liked the journey that I had because I started off doing the technical and I got good at that, and then I started off talking to customers and I got good at that, and then I moved into pro- so I, every time it was a bit of a bit of a step change, mm-hmm. and I I kind of grew my knowledge in that area. But yeah, it's it, it's a journey, you know, like with any career, it's a journey. But I think particularly in in MES and in manufacturing, there's so much to learn as you as you've already alluded to. Mm-hmm. Oh, that makes sense. And, and look, maybe you can talk, Matt, a little bit about the kind of journey with Info acquiring Lighthouse. And I think it was, what, 2021 that happened? Yeah, almost, it, it, last week it would have been two years ago. Oh, wow. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, we've, we've been at it for two years now, which is which is interesting. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a bit of an overview of that. Mm. So I guess maybe an introduction to Info first. Mm. So in, Info are the cloud ERP company. <laughs> and they've actually got a really interesting and, and compelling concept, which is industry specific ERPs. And that allows for better time to value for customers and a focus on the specific industry challenges that customers face in, in the in the ERP, but also in the wider kind of enterprise application landscape. But what they lacked was an MES. And as I said, we've got an MES. So, uh, so it's kind of the perfect acquisition. 
in for mes is i think it's really now an integral part of info story you know so i would describe it as a strategic part of info smart manufacturing vision Mm. Uh, and what you've got to remember about info is that not all but most of their customers are manufacturers Mm. so yeah pre-acquisition info had a number of you know, composable enterprise applications working together through their technology platform called InfoOS, but there wasn't really a connection to the shop floor and there wasn't the wealth of data that you get from an MES system and, and that kind of can lead to these additional insights. So yeah, acquiring Lighthouse was, I think it was a really strategic initiative to address that gap. And like I said earlier, we had very strong alignment on the industries. So that, that was very positive. I have to say, you know, when you're acquired, there's always a, a concern about how that's going to go. I, I was worried about it. There's, there's no denying that. Concerned about what the, what they would do with us, you know, what level of investment they would give us. You always kind of hear about horror stories of acquisitions that went <laughs> wrong, and it, that's not what I wanted. Yeah. You know, I was I was very happy at Lighthouse, and I and I and I wanted to continue a career doing doing what I loved. And yeah, so as as Lighthouse, yeah, we were about a hundred people in fours. 17,000 people, <laughs> quite, quite an, adjust, an adjustment. Yeah. Um, but we, yeah, we know we have a great product. And one of the challenges we had is that despite having a great product, despite having good feedback from market analysts and good customer feedback, and also despite having year on year profitable growth, we just weren't able to scale mm. at the level that we really thought we should be scaling at. And that's where Info comes in. And I think Info is, is already helping us and will continue to help us in that area. So, yeah, I was worried about the level of investment that Info would give us. That's true. But I needn't have been worried. You know, since like, we've scaled the MES team by about 50%, wow. so really significant investment over the last couple of years. You know, to be honest, any more than that at the moment, it would have been, it, it, scaling is hard. You know, so you've got yeah. to scale at a reasonable rate. And, and I think that, that we've done that. But also we've enabled hundreds of other M4 employees on MES. So we've not just scaled the immediate team, but we've kind of enabled the wider organization. Mm. So that's really fantastic. And I, and I think for me, that gives me the confidence that M4 are taking this seriously, you know, and there's way more to come. You know, there's some really exciting stuff in the pipeline. So um, yeah, watch this, watch this space. Yeah, no, re- really interesting to hear. And I guess from my side, I've been operating in, in MES now for kind of seven or eight years. And I've seen the landscape of the space change so much with the, the new kids on the block, with the low code, modular, you know, really quick time to value platforms versus the kind of legacy, you know, vendors that have been around since the kind of early days. And, you know, really interesting to see how the, the kind of place in the market is changing for companies. So, yeah, interesting to hear the journey that kind of you've been on with Infor and, and kind of where it's going in the future. Yeah, I think um, you, you've just hit the nail on the head, really. There's these kind of two ends of the spectrum. There's the low-code, no-code, agile environment that normally has less MES functionality, normally consider themselves to be an, an IoT platform, <laughs> which ironically, an MES is not also an IoT platform. <laughs> yeah. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you've got these kind of like monolithic, huge ERP systems from big companies that have kind of been around forever. And I think that's actually where we're uniquely positioned because we're kind of in the middle there. We are we are a, a very broad MES solution and we do have very broad functionality, but we're also very agile. We also do the IoT side of things. We're also low code, no code. You know, so I feel like we're we're very well positioned, kind of spanning both sides of the of that market. Mm. And and that's the kind of feedback we get from our from our customers as well, which is very nice to hear. I, I was just gonna say, you know, going forward. Within for an MES together, I see a really exciting opportunity, a really exciting opportunity. I think MES is a very, very significant value-add piece of the puzzle for Info and for Info's customers. And if you look at the analyst reports for things like the Info Cloud Suite ERPs, they always rank very well. And that's a, that's a really important part of the business. But there's this other part of the business that many people don't know about, which is that Info OS technology platform that I mentioned earlier. And the synergies between MES and the InfoOS technology platform, I think they're they're really pretty fantastic, to be honest. Um, I can give you a bit of an overview of, of InfoOS. Mm, yeah, please before, do. Yeah, but, but I mean, before I joined Info, I'd never really even heard of it. Um, I'd heard of the ERPs. We'd integrated yeah. with, some of their, with some of their ERPs for our customers. But but yeah, when I eventually heard about InfoOS and I saw its capabilities, I was really blown away by uh, blown away by its capability and by the vision of the of the InfoOS team. I think I think it's a huge differentiator for Info, and I think that that differentiation is is magnified with the combination of MES because the MES brings the exciting data from the shop floor. You know, it it, it amplifies that customer value. 
So, um, yeah, I probably won't do this justice, but I'll, I'll give it a go. To give more, <laughs> yeah. more information. Yeah, yeah. And insight is always helpful. Yeah, please do. Yeah, so I'll, I'll try and explain it as, as best I can. But in 4OS, it, it kind of pulls together everything. You know, it pulls it together and it combines it into a single user experience across, across a variety of different app- applications. So if you look at the market now, not just the MES market, the ERP market, composable applications is a huge topic. You'll have heard that being being mm. thrown around, I'm sure. And what that I, what I think that means to me is using the right application or the right system at the right time to do the right job. Don't try and make one application like the ERP, for example, do everything. You know, that's going to fail. You need to make sure you're using the right application at the right time to do the right thing. But if you want to have a composable strategy, then you need to have something that pulls it all back together, right? You need to have a combined user experience to access all of that data. And that's what InfoOS does. So applications push their data to the global data lake. And then InfoOS, I would say, orchestrates the integration across multiple sources through its data fabric layer to create a unified and consistent data environment. And on top of that data environment, it then has these advanced technologies. So it's got AI capabilities, machine learning capabilities, RPA, you know, robotic process automation, sorry, all layered on top to deliver this additional value to customers. And, you know, I'll be honest, I thought some of that AI ML stuff was a bit gimmicky a couple of years ago. Mm. You know, when it all kind of first came out and people were talking about these things, I was like, oh, are there any real use cases, you know? But I've done a complete 180 now, you know, mm-hmm. having seen some of the capabilities of this system. And, and I think manufacturers who don't adopt these technologies will get left behind. I actually did a poll on, on LinkedIn last week and I asked people, you know, how do you see AI ML technologies? Lots of people thought, you know, if you don't do it, you'll you know, you'll lose a competitive advantage. That was kind of the majority answer. Mm-hmm. But there are still some people who see it as a bit of a gimmick. And I think that's something that's going to change in the market going forwards. I think people are going to start to realize the kind of power that this this can bring um it's, yeah it's, infrared plays a really big part in that it's it's, it's quite incredible really no it's a, it's a good insight and it sounds super powerful matt but you touched on a point that but i'm really interested in is how that ai ml journey is is going around the factories and i think you know from my side as well i i hear day in day out buzzwords keywords and and everything that's happening in the industry and, and everybody likes to have their kind of you know a say on kind of where things are going. But I guess the kind of bit I keep hearing about is, is whether companies are primed for that, you know, implementation of these latest tools and tech. And a lot of it drives from that kind of executive layer, you know, chief I, CIOs, chief operations, chief digital officers, how much of the finger on the pulse are they with these, but also how finger on the pulse are companies with having people experienced in these areas, in these roles as well. So yeah, re- really interesting space in the market at the moment for, for everything like that. Yeah, I agree. I think with AI and ML and, and these kind of technologies, they, they are buzzwords. You know, people throw them around all over the place. They don't mean anything unless you've got a use case. Mm. They, they only mean something when you've actually got a problem to solve. And I think there are problems that can be solved using this technology. I think what's what's difficult about it is lots of people think it's kind of a black box. You just chuck all the data there and it'll give you some brilliant insights. <laughs> That's not how it works. You, know, you, you, <laughs> you have to have someone thinking about the problem they're trying to solve, making a hypothesis, working on an algorithm. You have to have data scientists. You have to put some effort in if you want to get the value out. And that again, that's one of the things that's, that's great about for us. It helps customers get the value out. And that's why I'm so excited about it with MES, because I would describe MES as kind of having a, a, a treasure trove of data. You know, it's got so much data. It's got more data than you could ever possibly look at. Hmm. You know, and, you, and these technologies are able to look at all of that data and put out the insights for you. If you can get... Rather than looking at a table with a load of data in, if you can be given an insight or told what to do, if it can be event driven, you, know, you need to go and change that tool now. Or did you know that you could move you know, someone from machine A to machine B and overall your output would increase? Or you know, the temperature on that machine is running a bit high. When it runs that high, you don't get as high product quality. Go look at bringing that. You know, those kind of things that it would take an army of people to to, to get that information if we, if we weren't using those technologies. So um so yeah, I think it's a really exciting space. The, the, the one use case that I love hearing about it, it with this, man, is the fact that with such an aging workforce and the skills gap and talent shortages in manufacturing, you, you're getting a huge discrepancy between the people that have been working there for 20, 30 years, retiring with the tribal knowledge and insight, but then the younger generation or kind of workers are now able to use you know AI or, or ML to, to kind of pull data about 
how best processes work, or as you say, kind of something's running too hot or some, you know, something needs to be repaired or fixed and giving insights that ordinarily just wouldn't have been provided with, without the tools and tech in place. Yeah. To be honest, I think yeah, these, these technology advancements in AI and generative AI and machine learning, when you think about that, you're able to use those tools to collect data faster than you, mm. to, to collect data faster, to make insights on that data faster. Imagine having your best employee working all of the time, yeah. <laughs> even on the night shift, you know, or even when it's an unskilled employee that's recently joined, mm. because the system is guiding them through that process. It's making some of those decisions for them, or it's guiding them in the right direction. So you don't have this kind of, I would say, variation of skill yeah. because the system is de-skilling the role for you. It's, it's making all of your employees do the right thing at the right time by systematizing those business processes. Really exciting future, I think. Yeah, I'm working with a couple of clients at the moment, software companies who are really focused on the kind of, you know, arming those the frontline workers with with kind of skills and being able to kind of provide that insights and repeatable service because, yeah, it's impossible to have that that otherwise. One of the things that kind of drew me to your profile, and I think maybe one of the areas that kind of got us connected, you know, earlier this year was your passion for spreading awareness for MES, you know, regularly sharing insight. And, and hopefully some of the audience listening will recognize your name and some of the content that you share. But but you run the, the MES Matters blog and, and page on LinkedIn. Tell us all a little bit more about your mission, your why, and, and that side of things. Yeah, the, the mission is very simple. Um, <laughs> I just want more people to understand MES. You know, I think there are a lot of people who think they get it. Controversial. I don't mean that in a rude way, but you know, there's there's a lot of different kind of definitions of MES out there, or there's people that have experience with kind of complementary applications and they think that they know what MES does. And yeah, there are some people that are either don't know anything about it or or other people that are kind of worryingly misinformed. So I'm hoping that I can help with that. I think it's a really interesting and exciting market, as I've, I've already touched on. And it's got huge growth potential. I know that the MES market is predicted to grow from 12 billion to over 30 billion by around 2030. I think the, the smart manufacturing market is also predicted to grow from about 30 billion to maybe 90 billion. Don't, don't quote me on that one in the same kind of time frame. And, you know, if you look at smart manufacturing, I think MES is it's a foundational enabler of smart manufacturing. You can't really do smart manufacturing mm-hmm. without without MES. But yeah, there's a lot of misunderstanding still. And if you talk to industry leaders, if you talk to people you know, in boardrooms, they're talking about smart manufacturing and automation and digital transformation and industrial IT and mm-hmm. industry 4.0. But not many people are talking about MES specifically, mm. which baffles me. You know, It really baffles me because actually for all of those things that I just listed out, all of those initiatives, MES is absolutely critical for each one. Yeah, so, it's Rosetta Stone, isn't it? Rosetta Stone for, for smart manufacturing. Exactly, exactly. And so you've got all of these people talking about these concepts, these these kind of big picture concepts, without really tying together the fact that actually an MES is a big part of solving those problems. You know, it underpins many of those concepts and technologies. Mm. Like I said, you can't have a smart factory without MES. You can't have a manufacturing digital transformation project without an MES. <laughs> you just can't do it. But people yeah. want those things and they don't want an MES is. That's, that's worrying, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. But I think MES isn't very glam and glitzy. You know, it doesn't sound very exciting. And, and I also think it doesn't help because MES means different things to different people. You know, originally we had the terminology MES. I think it's still the most widely used terminology. Yeah. But I think people kind of associate that more with a production execution system, maybe a bit of quality. Yeah. When it gets broader, people now start talking about MOM, Manufacturing yeah. Operations Management. But only a subset of the market talk about that. Some people yeah. still use MES. People talk about IoT platforms. There isn't a kind of a coherent market-wide messaging and terminology that's used for this market. So it that is a challenge in itself. Yeah, and I know a couple of companies that don't brand themselves as, as an MES vendor because they don't want to be lumped in with all the other ones and you know they want to have a standalone product that solves a different, slightly different tweak on that need. So yeah, it's definitely a fragmented space with labels, with names, but with insights and, and stuff as well. But I guess, look, from your side, the passion obviously shines through. I know you're a father, a husband, you've got a senior role, but you find time to kind of share insight, share wisdom with mission of kind of educating people. So, you know, kudos to you, Matt, on that. I think that's great. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, to be honest, yeah, it, it's fun to write the blogs. It's fun to write on LinkedIn. I, I actually, 
I really like the networking aspect of it. There are some, yeah. some really great people who comment on my on my content and, and I learn from them. You know, I don't know yeah. anything about MES. I know a lot about MES. I've worked in it, but I've worked in it in the areas that I know. And, and yeah. there are people with broader, wider experiences. And I love learning from them, talking to them. And and I like meeting new people and building relationships. And, and it's obviously working because uh, I get to have this lovely chat with you. Which I'm <laughs> grateful for. <laughs> no, I agree. And, and my mission and journey is pretty similar. Obviously, I'm attacking it from a, a recruitment perspective and, and helping on that side. But the networking piece and, you know, I work with companies across Europe, across the States and North America. And yeah, there's such a different understanding and appreciation. But you know, from my side, I've always thought myself in the, the center of a Venn diagram with manufacturers, technology companies, integrators, users. And so kind of get to hear all of these kind of use cases, stories, you know, tribal knowledge and just a really interesting space to be. So, so glad we kind of share that that passion on that, Matt. Um, but look, let me just ask you to, to put on those, you know, avatar ray vision glasses and, and kind of talk about some of the kind of future predictions for MES or maybe kind of some of the ideas of of kind of where you think the space is going. So yeah, share a little bit of your predictions for the future, Matt. That would be great. Yeah, sure. That's uh, that's always a good question, isn't it? What's yeah. going to happen? In the future? This will age well or it'll age bad. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we might be editing this video in a couple of years' time to take this section out. No, I, I think there are some things that are already starting to happen that will continue to happen. One of those is I think ERP is starting to retract back to its core functions. I think that's a it's a it sounds like a small thing, but it's actually a huge thing. Everyone knows ERP, not many people know MES. So for that knowledge kind of to shift into the, the MES space and for those things to kind of those boundaries to change is, is really powerful. I think historically ERP has encroached onto the shop floor. You know, c- customers who haven't had an MES, they've had problems on their shop floor. They may have had an Excel, paper, disparate departmental applications, and they've tried to solve some of those shop floor problems with ERP. That's the system they were using. They've tried to solve those problems. And there's nothing wrong with that. Lots of people have done that. You know, it, maybe you need to view the, the, the order schedule or, or you need to book back some production and scrap or you need to manually record some downtime. And as an initial foot in the door, those things, you know, a lot of people made a decision to do that by having ERP on the shop floor. But now the market is getting much more educated around applications like MES or certainly around smart manufacturing in general. And I think that, you know, they don't want ERP on the shop floor anymore. It's not the right application. It's not the right application. People want an MES now. They want an MES on their shop floor, synchronizing the data with ERP. And when I say synchronizing, I mean synchronizing the relevant data with ERP because ERP doesn't need all of the details. ERP isn't designed to take all of those details, but, but MES is. Yeah, and I think the other thing I'd add is, isn't an either or. I hear some people say, don't need an MES because, because you've got an ERP, or oh, if, you, <laughs> if, you, if you have an MES, maybe you don't need an ERP anymore. Absolutely couldn't be further from the truth. They are complementary applications. Mm-hmm. They work together, doing different roles. Um, the fact that they have a slight overlap is more due to the fact that, that, that historically those boundaries haven't been clear, but they do have two very distinct, two, two distinct roles to play. And yeah, and I think you know, implementing an MES and an ERP has many, many benefits for, for people, you know, n- not just around the kind of usability for the operational users, the real-time data, the connection to the machines. Those are the obvious things. But there are some less obvious things as well, like actually removing complexity from your ERP. You don't, people don't want complexity in their ERP. They want it to be simple. They want it to be, you know, they, they want it in the cloud. They want more um, kind of generic um, implementation. So MES can really help support that. And, and I think that's a real trend in the market at the moment, moving away from ERP on the shop floor and having this kind of distinct you know, boundary around, around the shop floor as, a, as an MES area. I think another trend I see a lot is kind of MES is becoming more of an enterprise application. I did a LinkedIn post on this a, a few weeks ago. Historically, I think MES was being bought at a plant level, often driven by operations, but now it seems to be much more driven at an enterprise level. Not all the time, but you know, kind of it's, that, that trend is incre- increasing. So why is that happening? I think manufacturers want a global standardization across master data. They want global standardization across their business processes. They want global reporting and benchmarking across their plants. So these kind of initiatives are being driven, not at plant level, but they're being driven at a much higher level in the organization. And it, and it's not uncommon now for COOs and CIOs to be the executive sponsors um, mm-hmm. of these types of projects, or certainly for the wider digital transformation projects, in, including MES. So I think that's another 
another big trend in the industry. I think a little bit on what we've talked about already, we have to recognize that the market is in flux. There's lots of different players coming at the market from many different angles. You've got ERP solutions with with front ends that are trying to do a, a, an MES light. You've got you know, automation companies with SCADA related systems that are trying to push up into the MES space. You've got IoT platforms, you've got connected worker, you've got pure play MES systems like we are. And, and everyone's trying to find a place in this market. And I, I think that's a challenge for everyone. But I, I think the beauty of an, of an MES system is that it covers most of those functionalities already in a single application. You don't need you don't need multiple applications to, to achieve those things. I think another big trend going forward is digital twin. You've mm-hmm. probably heard the term digital twin. It's another buzzword, of course, mm-hmm. but, but it's actually one with a lot of value. So the way I think of a digital twin, well, I, I actually think MES is already a digital twin, right? Because a digital twin is a it's a digital representation of something physical. Mm-hmm. And MES is a digital representation of the physical factory. Mm-hmm. But I think there's new levels in the digital twin. You know, the next thing is simulating and doing things like what if scenarios. So you know, a bit like I mentioned earlier, what if your MES system could recommend moving a resource, you know, move this person from line A to line B because you'll get an overall higher output in your factory? Or uh, MES saying you know, you, you, your bottleneck is your packing area. So if you put another packing machine in, these these are the kind of OE figures you could get. Yeah, that's you interesting. Look at a case for investment. So I think digital, digital twin is going to help to drive data-driven ROI discussions and be a really big part of that of that discussion. And then finally, I think just it's all about the data. Yeah. <laughs> it's all about the data, and there's so much data you just can't possibly take advantage of it all at the moment. Yeah, you can collect data faster than you can view it. That's a fact. And it's around these new technologies coming in that we've already talked about in depth. You know, being able to take that data and and, and rather than have someone trawl through it, or or in the in the case most of the time not trawl through it and therefore not make any insights, get the applications to to pull out the insights for you and, and to make recommendations. I think for people who adopt that style going forward, it'll be a game changer. And I think that it's kind of strange really, because you've got all these people on the in manufacturing who are still using paper and Excel. You've got other people who have kind of transformed into using an MES. And now you've also got people who are using like advanced automation and robotics and some of these advanced technologies. Mm. The gap between the the most and least advanced is is increasing. It's becoming a bit of a chasm, to be honest with you. Yeah, some some really interesting insights there, man. And we we'll have to see whether where, where, whether you're on the money on those. But but I think it's really interesting to hear you talk with the passion, the enthusiasm, but also kind of like the kind of guided insight that you bring. So I think there's tons of wisdom and insight in this episode, which I think the audience will like. So re- really do appreciate you taking the time out to kind of join me and, and kind of chat through this all. No worries. To, to be honest, I've really enjoyed it. Like I said, I love the interaction on LinkedIn. I love building that network, talking to people. And I've watched plenty of your podcasts in the past and, and really got a lot of value from them. So yeah, if, if people get value from this, then that's music to my ears. I, I hope that they do. Yeah, and I'll leave the details for your blog and the info site and everything in the comments, Matt, so people can can jump on and follow you, be it from, from a customer perspective or just a, a knowledge learning perspective. Perfect. Yeah, I mean, if anyone's got any questions and they want to reach out to me, then yeah, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm easily accessible. Send, <laughs> send me a message and I'm happy to talk. Yeah, cheers, Matt. Thanks for joining me. Bye. Thank you, Daniel. Bye. Well, that's it for another episode. I hope you enjoyed it and most importantly, took some knowledge and insight moving forward. If you're a fan of the podcast, please subscribe and hit like. And if you're a super fan, please share with your colleagues and friends. If you'd like to be a guest on a future episode, please drop me a line on LinkedIn or via email. Details below. Thanks for listening.